The following interview was conducted with Renee Thomas, the director of the Black Cultural Center for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on November the 20th, 2007 at Stewart Center um, B26. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Tell us a little bit why you were born in your early years and parents and siblings. New Jersey is my home state um, and grew up on the South Jersey end of uh, New Jersey rural community, uh, beach town community, Cape May, New Jersey. Um, I am the uh, daughter of one of three uh, children, I have an older sister and a younger brother, and my parents still reside there in New Jersey. Okay. So they what was uh, going to school like? Was it close in town, and was it a large school, or your early years in school? It's a fairly small school. Uh, our class had less than 200 people in the graduating class, and uh, right up the street, walking distance to school. Uh, they did have buses as well, uh, but we were within walking distance of the elementary school. Did you go to high school there too? Did attend high school there as well. Okay. Um, have a long tradition and history in the area. Uh, my grandparents are actually from that area, so third generation um, in the Cape May area. And prior to that, uh, North Carolina is, is the roots of our family. Okay, what was high school like and how large was your graduating class? High school was a, a remarkable experience, lots of fun, energy. Uh, was very involved as a student in high school and the graduating class was about just under 200 in okay. the graduating class. Was there class. any particular clubs that you were interested in or that you were a member of? How about athletics? Were you involved in that at all? I was involved in athletics, played on the women's basketball team, um, not at the high school level, but at junior high level. And then in high school, I was a cheerleader for both uh, varsity football and basketball. Good, very good. And then what was next? Uh, tell us a little about where you went to college, what campus life was like, and your major and the professors, and tell us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Attended Trenton State College, which is now renamed the College of New Jersey, uh, located in Hillwood Lakes, right outside of Trenton, New Jersey. A very small liberal arts college, about 5,000 students total. Uh, actually majored in political science, African American studies minor. I uh, was very involved there, uh, both through the Women's Studies program, uh, took a lot of classes in Women's Studies and Political Science and African American Studies. Was very involved in the campus community, actually worked as an RA uh, in the residence life system and did that for two and a half years and I think that that really shaped me to want to go in the Student Affairs Division. Okay. How, how large was the, the campus and was there, uh, you know, uh, some of their extracurricular activities that uh, you sort of participated in? At the and time just, yeah. while I was there, it was about 5,000 students uh -huh. and I did live on campus my entire uh, undergraduate career, so I was involved a lot with the residence hall community. Um, took a variety of classes. Gloria Dickerson, who was at that time the chair of the African American Studies program, was a very influential person for me and got involved in the Black Student Union while I was a, a student on campus and then uh -huh. some leadership opportunities through residence life. Good. And you like being the RA. That's, that must have been uh, nice in the residence hall, getting it, the activities. It was yeah. a lot of fun. And back then it was a all-female hall, um, which I uh, was a resident director. Uh, with, so I had a floor of about 53 women. Oh, okay. Then what uh, after uh, what happened after college? Tell us before you came to Purdue and how you happened to come to Purdue. Prior to coming to Purdue, I was at Ohio University for about five years. I uh, finished up my undergraduate education, went to Ohio University, worked in the Office of Affirmative Action as an assistant director. And uh, about my fourth year into that position, took a leave of absence and went over to student activities and did multicultural programming and student activities. At, the, at Ohio? At Ohio University. Uh -huh. Uh, and during that same time period, I also pursued a master's degree as well. Uh, the opportunity became available here at Purdue to work at the Black Cultural Center, which was very attractive um, in terms of the quality of programming that the Black Cultural Center was known for on a national level, and took advantage of the opportunity and transplanted myself here to okay. Purdue back in 1990. Oh my goodness, not too, it seems not too long ago, doesn't it? Um, now, the Black Cultural Center, let's talk a little bit about, you were on the chair of the facilities planning for the new facility. And tell us a little about the fundraising. I'm thinking of things also that researchers can benefit by how the building came to be and the new facility that okay. you were involved in. Uh, 
Go ahead. Sure. The Black Cultural Center was actually founded at Purdue University in 1969 and officially dedicated in uh, 1970. However, the new facility came on board in 1999, so we have a fairly long tradition and history here at the university campus. And in 1969, if you were to look at it from a civil rights standpoint of view, it was a fairly turbulent time here in the United States. It was, uh, I would say, it was one of the it was a period of time in which we began to see a large number of African-American students going to predominantly white colleges and universities. And whenever they arrived on the campus, and particularly Purdue University, they really felt as African-Americans there was nothing that was really reflective of their cultural and heritage. And as a result of some student activism on campus, the Black Cultural Center was founded. Sort of speed uh, forward to 1999 and the involvement in the Facilities Planning Committee, uh, there was, a, a, again, a recognized need that uh, the facility that we were in previously was an old residential uh, house that had a lot of plumbing issues and a lot of things that go along with the house that's house. 100 years plus old. Um, and the university was uh, really beginning to reaffirm its commitment to diversity and the facility of a new black cultural center freestanding facility was uh, a unique way in which Purdue University could uh, give a quote-unquote a concrete example of their commitment to diversity. One of the other things that happened is that the black cultural center through its programming um, and activities and I, and I must give recognition uh, to Antonio Zamora, who was the previous director mm -hmm. and served in that role for 25 plus years, uh, really laid a solid foundation for the Black Cultural Center. And the Cultural Center has been recognized on a national level in terms of the quality of programming uh, that was housed at the Black Cultural Center and needed a facility to complement the high quality and, and the caliber of programming that we we currently do and have done historically. Sure. How does the, was the land was given to by the university and then how did the fundraising come about? Were you involved in that? And also the facilities, tell us a little bit about what that committee, you were the chair of the facilities planning committee, right. I guess. The facilities planning committee was responsible for the identification and selection of an architect for the facility. Also developed a, a plan in terms of what type of space would be most appropriate for the Black Cultural Center, how large, how small, and also recognizing that we did have some resource issues as well in terms of, of, of the uh, amount of money for the facility. So it was a team of individuals. We worked uh, very closely with Purdue Physical Facilities Plant. Tom Schmink at the time uh, was our uh, primary architect that we worked with. And uh, we were very successful in the identification of some African-American architectural firms uh, to compete for the bidding process. And we were delighted in that we were able to secure Walter Blackburn of Blackburn Architectural Firm out of Indianapolis. And it was somewhat unique in that he had a connection to Purdue University and that he attended Purdue as an undergraduate student. Um, transferred and got his architectural degree from another institution, but he did have a Purdue connection. Sure. And then also he and his company brought with them a great level of sensitivity relative to the architectural elements and incorporating some very distinguishable African elements into the design of the facility that also complemented the landscape of the university so that it wasn't a, a odd looking building like in a that. red brick campus, but it was something that uh, was integrated into the larger campus landscape, mm -hmm. but yet also had some very distinguishable African features incorporated, and that was important to sure. us. Did you happen to visit any other sites in, as part of the planning or not? I, I had had an opportunity oh. to visit uh, not necessarily cultural centers, uh, because at that time period, there were only probably two other freestanding black cultural center facilities. Oh. Uh -huh. So we were on the cutting edge with this, but I did have an opportunity to, to visit a couple African-American museums and do some benchmarking um, at a couple museums. Yeah, that sounds good. And then uh, you had an advisory committee. Marcus Clark was chair of the fundraising advisory committee, mm -hmm. and uh, so you worked with him. So there was a fundraising committee that was involved, and it worked with the university for yes. the fundraising. Okay. Uh, it was and a $3 million project. Stephen C. Beering, who was the president of the university at that time, uh, offered a $1 million challenge grant and indicated that if we could successfully raise the additional dollars that he would commit a million dollars of university funding towards the construction of the Black Cultural Center facility. And Marcus Clark, who is an alum 
of Purdue, a former executive of Ford Motor Company, uh, stepped up and chaired our fundraising uh, committee and worked diligently to secure uh, resources for the construction of the facility. Yeah, so you worked with him. So he had a fundraising committee yes. to go along with it then. Now you've been, you were made the, the director, what, uh, 96, correct? That's correct? Let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges and the opportunities at the center that you've, and uh, it's open to the entire campus and also some of the programs you mentioned a little bit before and I was going to ask a little bit later about some of the other groups, but some of the programs, mm -hmm. programming. We have uh, so, uh, sort of a three-pronged approach to our programming at Good. the Black Cultural Center. One is a, a very strong focus on our students, and we involve our students through the performing arts ensembles. And we have four different performing arts ensembles, which include the Jahari Dance Troupe, which is our dance company, and they're trained in a variety of skills and techniques ranging from traditional African dance all the way up to what you would see on music video dance styles. We also have a choir. The Black Voices of Inspiration, which primarily is a gospel choir. They also do traditional Negro spirituals and other popular songs of inspiration by African-American composers. The Drama Company is the New Directional Players, and they're committed to presenting thought-provoking plays about the African-American experience. And then our last student ensemble is the Haraka Writers, which is our creative writing ensemble, and they write poetry, short stories, prose, and essays. Each of those ensembles are instructed by artists in residence, which are world-class artists. Uh, we have a very high quality of artists in residence who come down once a week, work with our students, preparing them for their on and off campus performance engagements, and really produce very high quality performances. Uh, we adopt this model, what we call edutainment, and edutainment is the combination of education and entertainment merged into one word. And that as you look at other student performing arts groups across the campus, they are that. They are performing arts groups. We take a, a little bit different approach in that we feel that we have a responsibility to educate our audience as well. So we talk about the contributions of African Americans and if you were to attend a Black Voices of Inspiration concert, not only would you learn about or hear beautiful gospel music, but you will also learn about what is the significance of the, of the traditional Negro spiritual and why is it relevant to this particular culture. And that's the same for each of the performing mm -hmm. arts ensembles. How do you, your artists in residence, how do you choose, the, uh, choose them? Does, uh, do you have a group or does someone help you in the selection um, for the artists in residence that come here? Yes. Is it usually just on a year basis or? It varies. Okay. Um, we are one of our previous choral directors was with us for 14 years. Um, another one, we only stayed a year and a half, so it, it really sure. um, varies. But we try to put a call out uh, to various schools in which we know we have they have strong arts programs, sure. uh, work with faculty members for recruitment of them, and they actually go through an interviewing process, not only with the staff at the center, but also involve the students in, in a workshop to make that selection. Yeah. You have um, the students that are involved, do some of them stay a couple of years within the, within the groups as well? Yes. Uh, our retention is very good with the students. I think that they really find a, a niche being on a, an on an engineering, science, and agricultural campus, that is the major of most of our students. And the performing arts ensembles provide a delicate balance for them to have a creative outlet in addition to their academic to their journeys. Right, yeah. Uh, and then with the diversity, and then you have your grand, tell us a little about the grand opening. How did that, uh, for, well, I'm thinking of for the Black Cultural Center when you had that for the homecoming, for <laughs> researchers, what sort of planning and things went into that? Well, that was one of my most memorable experiences, uh, is the, the dedication of the new Black Cultural Center facility. We involved quite a number of alumni in that, uh, invited our donors who participated in the fundraising campaign and uh, a lot of symbolism in terms of a libation ceremony that that happened um, during that dedication as well as featured our performing arts ensembles as part of that dedication and then we actually put in a, um, a time capsule at the Black Cultural Center. So at the front entry of the building, there's a portal that's disconnected from the facility. And as you enter that portal, on the left-hand side, there's a, a placard that reads 1999, the, the date that uh, the center was founded. And inside that 
is uh, different memorabilia that we thought was important to include uh, so that at some unknown date, whenever that You didn't set open, the date for opening it? <laughs> um, we will be able to, to see some of the memorabilia. What are some of, do you recall what some of the things are that are in there? We placed the, the program uh, for the uh, dedication, and it's interesting because at that time we had uh, VHS tapes of some of the performances uh, by the Performing Arts Ensemble so that people could see the type of work that we were uh, producing there at the Black Cultural Good. Center. Some brochures, programs of previous things that we've had. Oh, that'll be very interesting to see when they do. Uh, uh, you talked a little bit, about one of the, um, uh, and the artists in your programming, one of the things you have is your cultural art series. Yes. Yeah, and tell us a little bit about the programming on, on that is, and you had um, that Reverend Fonderoy came. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do, uh, one of the unique things that I enjoy about the Black Cultural Center is that we're committed to programming throughout the entire Camp, uh, throughout the entire academic year. On many traditional uh, white campuses, what you will find is that during Black History Month, there's a tremendous amount of programs and activities relative to the African American experience. And then the rest of the year, mm, there's not a whole lot going on uh, relative to the cultural history. But at the Purdue Black Cultural Center, we're committed to programming throughout the entire academic year. So it, in addition to February, Black History Month, you'll have programs in October and throughout the entire year. And we've really had some exciting presentations on campus that were sponsored or co-sponsored by the Black Cultural Center. Some examples include Maya Angelou, uh, yes. renowned poet, uh, had a presentation here. Dick Gregory, uh, Michael Eric Dyson was just on campus this past fall. Filmmaker Spike Lee uh, has been on campus, sponsored by the Black Cultural Center. So each and every year throughout the academic year, there are multiple guest speakers and performers that present both scholarly research as well as some entertainment to the Purdue community, all from an Afrocentric perspective. You might, that takes a lot of time, that programming, and trying to get line of speakers, I would imagine, doesn't it? It does. But it's a challenge. It's, it's a challenge, and it's always um, difficult sometimes to have your pulse on the student body because what you think is exciting for the students, sometimes <laughs> they think, oh, that's boring, or you know, that type of thing. So. Uh, working through that and also recognizing that we want to make some connections with the academic community as well and making sure, sure that some of the speakers and performers complement what's going on in the academic classroom in such a way that faculty will encourage their students to attend as well as faculty members right, attending. Right, exactly. Now, I, you had that one speaker on the history of the Underground Rail, Railroad in the Midwest. That must have been an interesting thing. A lot of people don't realize that or they forgot, you know, they're not, they're unaware of it, mm -hmm. that it, there really was. That must have been a good program. It was a great program and each year we do a, a cultural and educational tour um, in the spring semester in which we try to identify sites that are within a, a drivable distance from the campus and invite both students as well as community members and part of that experience we also went up to Battle Creek, Michigan and they have such a rich history there with the Underground Railroad in the Battle Creek area and even here in Lafayette um, we started off that particular trip here in Lafayette we had an individual from the Art Museum in Lafayette talk about uh, different sites in the Lafayette community and then we went over to Cincinnati, Ohio and visited the Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati. They have a Ohio. museum or center over there. I think yes. I read about that. Yeah, and a, and a, a nice uh, connection with Purdue is that the same architect that designed the Purdue Black Cultural Center designed the Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, which is about a 100,000 square foot facility, so wow. it's about 10 times the size of our cultural center on campus. Yeah, that's nice. Um, and then you had, um, tell us about the Tuskegee Airmen. You had. Colonel McKee here, mm -hmm. and that he must have been an interesting, I was not able to attend that, but that must have been quite an interesting It session. was fascinating, and uh, the Tuskegee Airmen have such a strong brotherhood. Several of his, uh, I guess, colleagues uh, from the Indianapolis area came up to support him, so we actually had an opportunity to have five Tuskegee Airmen present, although Colonel McGee was the featured speaker sure. and he did the presentation. But that it just was added just such to a it. historic moment to, to be able to see the camaraderie that existed, uh, you know, 50, 60 years later. Yeah. 
And that that's very good. Um, you you mentioned a little bit earlier, but I want to ask you: you have those field research tours, like you've gone to the Harlem Renaissance. How do you come up with your the themes and things of that sort, and arranging, making arrangements on those? And what, when you've gone to Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. and we implement it. Is that just one semester, or do you run it through the year? Yes, what we do fall semester. There's a fall research tour and then okay. spring semester is the cultural educational tour which is open to the public. Okay. Um, about five years ago we started the cultural uh, research tours um, and what that is is that we identify a particular theme and throughout the entire fall semester all of our program will be around a particular theme. The first year that we started it we focused on the Harlem Renaissance and uh, we had an opportunity to, it, it's a closed tour it's for those students who are involved in our performing arts ensembles. What we do is uh, take a group of about 40 students uh, to a particular location, do a tremendous amount of research, and I'll give the example of Harlem, New York. When we were there, we went to the Schomburg Center for Research. We had an opportunity to do a walking tour of Harlem and hear about the different facilities that were there. Um, and then had a scholar in residence come in and, and talk with the students about the Harlem Renaissance and then had the students actually participate in master class instruction so that the students took a master class with the Boys Choir of Harlem. For those who were involved in our Black Voices of Inspiration, our dancers went over to Alvin Alley Dance Studio, took a master dance class. And what they do is they come back to the campus community, compile all that research that they acquired and then present it to the campus community in an artistic format during our cultural arts festival. When we went down to Birmingham, Alabama, oral history collection was a significant part of that research tour. Students had an opportunity to interview some of those who individuals who were college students at the time of the civil rights movement and hear about being attacked by the German shepherds or hearing about being hosed down. And this one woman, is a very powerful story, when she pulled her hair back, you could see that there was no growth in a particular segment as she talked about the power of the water hoses scalping her. Wow. Um, and again, the students have an opportunity to embody uh, those experiences, work with the artists in residence, and then present their research in artistic format to the campus community. The other component of the research tour, in addition to those, that small group of 40 students that actually does the research, is that we have complementary programs on campus so that throughout the fall semester, whenever we were focusing on the Harlem Renaissance, we had some scholars come in, present on the Harlem Renaissance. We had a play performed about the Harlem Renaissance era so that the campus community can become more familiar with the content of whatever our theme is for that year. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, this is the fifth year. We started out Harlem um, Renaissance era. We traveled to Harlem, New York. We went to, the following year, we focused on the Civil Rights Movement went down to Birmingham, uh, Alabama, and Montgomery, and um, Civil Rights Institute that's housed there. Uh, we followed that up, went to Puerto Rico, uh, did a study on the Afro-Latin diaspora, and that was very intentional because at that time it was whenever the Latino Cultural Center was founded at, at Purdue University, and we wanted to have this collaboration mm -hmm. so that people would see that we were working in partnership rather than competing with one another. So we focused on the Afro-Latin diaspora, and, as you look at the Atlantic slave trade, a tremendous amount of enslaved Africans are in Puerto Rico. So there's some real cultural retentions that are still there in a, a town called Louisa, um, in which some of the enslaved Africans escaped uh, from slavery and developed their own community there. So we did that. And two years ago, we went to Hollywood to focus on African-American images and art and where about did you media. visit? And did you go to some of the studios when you were there? Yes, we did. Oh. Uh, we went to Universal Studios um, and actually had some master classes with a, a, a couple uh, individuals who are involved in uh, and on not even not only on stage but also in, in film as well. And that was the year that we hosted Spike Lee as a complimentary program to the African American Images and Film and Media. So you blend that whole theme together, the research, and brings in the community, the whole involvement of the whole planning. Exactly. Very good. Yes. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, the um, Porter, uh, any, what theme did you have this year? In, this year we focused on the blues, the okay. Miss and Morris, the and they're still the going blues on. tradition. Right. Yes, yeah. 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 So we traveled down to Memphis, Tennessee, uh, the home of the blues, uh, had an opportunity to walk down Beale Street and hear a wonderful array of, of blues musicians, and uh, then continued the tour to Clarksdale, Mississippi. 
had an unbelievable experience for the students in that we actually housed them in, uh, on a plantation that has been converted and they have sharecropper shacks on these, this plantation. And so the students had an opportunity to stay in the sharecropper shacks, which is a very small, intimate I space. Bet. Uh, I bet. But it really gave them a feel for um, part of their history and culture in well, terms what of it was the like. American experience. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. One of the things that you had is that Brown at, at 50, when you had the, the people from the Brown. Tell us a little bit about that program. Yes. And the anniversary for that. Mm -hmm. uh, Brown versus Board of Education is a, was a very significant decision um, in terms of the integration of uh, black people in education system. And during the 50th anniversary, we had the honor of having mm -hmm. two of the uh, Brown sisters come to campus and talk about their experiences. And not just from a historical standpoint of view, but also uh, brought it up to be very contemporary uh, discussion as well. And we were really proud about um, that moment of having them both on campus. And actually, there was an article in the JET magazine that highlighted the Brown Sisters presentation here at Purdue University in uh, JET magazine, which is a, a mainstream mm -hmm. uh, magazine for the African American community. Sure. What do they do? What do the sisters uh, sisters do now? Do they live close to one another, or no? They came oh. from two different uh, locations and met up here at Purdue. They, but they keep in touch. Yes, though, right? absolutely. Yeah. Uh, do keep in touch, and, and one of them is an educator. Yeah. Do they are they uh, asked? Do they give many talks at all, or they're sort of involved in their families, or what? The, I, the 50th anniversary presented a, an opportunity for them to come together and, and present a lot more than what they had previously uh, that was presented. That a little special thing there. Let's talk a little bit about the library. I know Ford gave the Forning, Ford Learning Research Center. Mm -hmm. Is that a separate part within the library or is that, uh, how did that come about? It actually, uh, again going back to Marcus Clark who was the chair of the facilities, uh, excuse me, the fundraising committee, he was an executive at Ford Motor Company sure. and uh, helped facilitate facilitate um, that particular gift to uh, the Black Cultural Center Library. So our, our stack area is named the Ford Learning Resource Center area. Yeah. And he, uh, you've got a, it's a very large and extensive library too, yes. and a well, good, good sized facility. And I know one of the things I read said the library would be beneficial to students, which it certainly is. And yes. Keep adding to them, and Dorothy's in touch with us, you know, mm -hmm. quite a bit, so that's nice. The, now we have some, um, the, uh, Doug Christensen, when he was here, said, and you do help with the recruitment of minorities, that they visit the Black Cultural Center. Doug said that uh, we try to connect with the people, so it's involved in getting the students on campus. They mm -hmm. visit the center. Yes, we're very involved, not only with undergraduate admissions, but we also work um, pretty busy in the summer with some of the summer re summer programs that are that targeting have. students of color, particularly even as young as the fourth and fifth grade sure. um, age group. And then our uh, recruiting doesn't end at admissions. We also work closely with Dwight Lewis in the graduate program with the Historically Black uh, College okay. Visitation Program. And then uh, for some faculty and staff searches once they get down to the top candidates, if sure. there happens to be an African American finalist, oftentimes we're involved in the recruiting mm -hmm. of those uh, candidates as well. Do the, the ones from the Historical Black, do they also visit the center too? Yes, they do. And that's mm -hmm. been going, his program has been going on for a long time. Yes, and that's yeah. part of uh, sure. the program is that they come over and tour the Black Cultural Center facility, particularly for that uh, population of students coming from a predominantly black institution into an arena such as Purdue University, sometimes it can be a little bit of a cultural shock. Yeah. So we let them know that there are support services here at the Black Cultural Center for them to thrive at, at the university. And then when you walk up that building, it's just awesome. I mean, from the outside. And you have some wonderful handouts that you've given that describes, you know, the, the facility, the facade, both inside and outside, because I know we have a copy in the library, and it's just, it, and then you go and you look at it, it's just awesome. It's really put how they all put it together there. Now we have some other cultural centers, don't we, on, on campus, and you're work, working together yes. and sharing some programs and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. I imagine. Um, there is a Latino cultural center mm -hmm. uh, that celebrates the three year anniversary, and then the New the Native one. American, uh, excuse me, Native American Cultural and Educational Center, uh, which is, they just hired a director uh, this academic year, Veronica Hirsch, is providing the administrative leadership for that. And the three cultural centers now report through the Office of the Provost. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, 
previously, uh, prior to November of last year, the Black Cultural Center had a different reporting structure that we reported through uh, Housing and Food Service Division. Now all three cultural centers are reporting through the Office of the Provost, recognizing the, the academic mission of the university, of the, of the, right, each exactly. of the centers. Okay. Uh, leadership, and uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, a little bit of leadership. And you sort of have some programs for the students along that line for the female, for the students that are there, mm -hmm. and which is helpful to them. Yes. And we do several different leadership development type Good. of experiences. Uh, we have a mentor program that's a, a fairly yeah, informal mentor that. program right. uh, that we administer at the, at the Cultural Center. And then we have uh, leadership development activities. We work very closely with the Dean of Students Office. Sometimes they do a lot of leadership and we're, we are always uh, referring students to participate in some other existing programs because we want to be sensitive not to uh, how do I want to say it? Not to duplicate what is currently available at the university, but provide access to those things that are work hand in hand, in tandem. Exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. So we do an entrepreneurial workshop. We do a professionalism development and an etiquette workshop. Those types of activities. Yeah, and that's good for this. For this. But what's the average? You know, how many? But how many students do you have in all the groups? Would you say approximately you know, that you have? We have about, and I'm going to define it in two different ways, we have about 120 students who are actively involved. Okay. And I define actively involved meaning that they're in rehearsal at the Black Cultural Center for five to six hours per week. Okay. Those are our active participants. In addition to that, uh, we do track attendance at our programs and events. And on average, we service 60,000 students. And many of them are repeat students that they'll go to this lecture and that lecture and, and, and be double counted in that way. But we know that we um, physically touch about 60,000 uh, individuals good. throughout the academic year. Right. And one of the new things that's just nice, you have that orientation when the new, in the fall. Yes. At Boiler Fest, which is really, mm -hmm. and uh, that gives them kind of a, you know, and, and sort of tied in with the football weekend and things of that sort, so it kind of all comes together, exactly. which makes it nice, yeah. Um, the um, Black Cultural Center and Diversity, that mm -hmm. sort of works together. Yes. Any comments on that? Or? Well, I, I'm very pleased about um, the progress that the university has made in terms of its commitment to diversity, particularly as it relates to the Black Cultural Center in terms mm -hmm. of new facility, uh, providing resources for us to continue to expand and enhance our programming uh, here. And then the, the vital role that we play, whether it's the recruitment, uh, increasing the numbers of African American students enrolled here at Purdue, and also faculty and staff sure. presence. And the retention is also key there too as well. Absolutely. One right. of the, the nice things about the Black Cultural Center is that about three years ago we began tracking the academic progress of our students. And what we found is that those students who are actively involved in the performing arts ensembles, and again that active is five to six hours of rehearsal sure. time at the Black Cultural Center, they tend to perform better academically than those students who are not involved. They have a higher grade point average than the overall um, grade point average, and it's significantly different between those African American students who are involved in the Black Cultural Center and those who are not involved. Those students who are involved tend to perform better academically. Sure, that's interesting. You've got a couple of awards. I think that uh, University Dream Award, that's very nice. Congratulations. Thank you. How did you find out about it? Did they let you know in advance, or how did that come about? Yes, uh, Dr. Rollick uh, telephoned me, and it, it was such a uh, honor uh, to be recognized because it is a it was very humbling uh, as well and, and the timing of it could not have been better because it was one of those days where I think we all have some frustrations and <laughs> it's what I'm doing really meaningful type of thing and then to be acknowledged in that way was very humbling yeah, and you also got the tell us about the salute to women you were one of those with you got that award yes. from the community mm -hmm. you're involved I mean in many of your activities draw a lot of people from the community, yes. don't you? And the, the outreach that yes. you're doing. The Salute to Women Award is uh, an annual award presented by the local YWCA. Mm -hmm. And again, it, that time, uh, it, was, it was several years ago, it was right prior to the construction of the new Black mm -hmm. Cultural Center facility, so it, it was very meaningful as well. Um, and the Black Cultural Center is indeed committed to community engagement and outreach, and we do a tremendous amount of programming, not only on campus, but outreaching to the, to the uh, 
Greater Lafayette and West sure. Lafayette. And you go to the schools and things of that sort within yes. the community. Mm -hmm. We do art and education programs in the local school system. This past week, uh, again with our theme of blues, we had a, a blues artist and educator on campus, sure. uh, Fruitland Jackson, and then we did a community outreach with Miami Elementary in, the, in which he did an assembly uh, for over 500 students participated in, in that That's assembly. Right. In your in the center, you have an ext a very large art collection. Take make a couple comments. I'm thinking of researchers that who would be visiting and tell us a little bit about what the nature of that collection is. The the collection has been acquired over the years, primarily a focus on West African artwork of indigenous people. Uh, and if you were to look at the African slave trade, uh, a large number of people can trace their roots mm -hmm. back to West African coastal area, so that's where uh, the majority of our artwork comes from. We have a, a couple really neat uh, pieces in the collection. We have several uh, other twin figures on the Yoruba uh, tradition. Many twins uh, are part of that. And then we also have uh, some beautiful uh, fabric, kente cloth fabric, um, yes, you do. that is uh, it's unique in that it's hand woven by men in the community as opposed to women. Um, Interesting. Four inch strips and then sewn together to present a beautiful fabric of royalty. Uh, and then we also have some Mindy mask. And again, those Mindy masks, traditionally masks are worn by men, uh, but these masks are worn by women and sculptured of women. Very interesting, yes. How about a, um, got an outstanding event in your life that you'd like to share with us or a favorite memory of Purdue or a long memory? Any comment on that? You think of something? I think my favorite Purdue memory we d discussed earlier, it was the uh, dedication of the new Black Cultural Center facility yeah. that really uh, it was and continues to be one of the highlights. And I think part of that is is because being at a, a major institution such as Purdue University, you have an opportunity to interact with some of the best and the brightest students across not only the nation but the world. And to have those students come back as alumni during homecoming weekend or a dedication and, and know that there has been a, a small role uh, that you played in, in shaping those individuals, it's just yeah. wonderful. Do you keep in touch with the alumni? Do you have an alumni group too as well? Do they get together at the center? That, uh Yes, we do. We have a, there's a Purdue Black Alumni uh, Board, uh, excuse me, Black Alumni Organization, PBAO, Purdue uh -huh. Black Alumni Organization. They annually prepare homecoming activities and part of our commitment to them is to have an annual welcome back reception uh, at the Black Cultural Center and then we do a tailgate activity on the parking lot of the BCC during homecoming weekend. So very active with our alumni. That's very nice. And you have the, uh, you get you have awards too, don't you, an award series for the students at the end. That, tell us a little bit about that particular yes. one. At the end the of this students. semester we do an annual awards program in which we honor the students who have participated in our performing arts ensembles, as I said earlier, they, are, they all volunteer and they put in a tremendous amount of Sounds time, like effort, and energy. And we like to highlight those students at the end of the academic year. And about three years ago, uh, we began, when I, we started tracking the academic progress of our students, we implemented um, the Donald Hall Academic Achievement Award, in which students who achieve at least a 3.6 or better, who are members of our ensembles, get special recognition and uh, financial stipend as part of that recognition. That's very nice, and they appreciate that. And yes. That's nice. That's very... Any questions that uh, I didn't ask that you, or some uh, summary or overall comments that you'd like to share with the researchers? I, I would uh, like to highlight a little bit more about the Good. library. Good. And uh, we did talk briefly about the Ford uh, gift to that, but in terms of our collection, it is a special collection. Most of the books and materials are related to the African or African American experience. There's also um, wonderful online resources that are available at the library, and a, a feature that we have at the library is that we subscribe to newspapers that are African American owned and produced newspapers with a particular focus of uh, papers from those communities in which we have large numbers of African American students coming from so that they can come to the BCC library, read about what's going on from the sure. black student newspaper's perspective and, and stay connected to their communities, as well as we um, do a vertical file clipping of sure. local news stories and events relative to the African American experience.
Yeah, and, you, and it's heavily used. Uh, you mentioned earlier that there are only about two black cultural centers. Are there more on campuses today than, than several years ago, or is it about, how has that changed, if at all? Yes, and let me clarify, two right. black cultural centers facilities that were freestanding new construction facilities. Uh, there probably are about 250 different uh, black cultural centers uh, throughout the country. There is a National Association of Black Cultural Centers. Um, they do an annual conference each year, and I've had an opportunity to present at the, the conference multiple times um, and uh, we actually received a major award from that association uh, in terms of our website design and, and what we're doing with the website and um, so there are multiple uh, Black cultural centers, multicultural centers on university college campuses. But not as many freestanding, which is what produces this. They're not as many freestanding, that's correct. And I don't have the number of freestanding uh, facilities, but I, I would say in the last, since we uh, went into construction in 1999, we've had over 36 different colleges and universities come to the Black Cultural Center sending benchmarking delegations, whether they be their chancellors, dean of students, or however the organizational structure is on their campus, visit the Black Cultural Center to get ideas about how they could enhance their cultural centers on, on their campuses. And um, I know that there are multiple freestanding facilities now in addition to the Purdue Black Cultural Center, just down the road, IU has a, a freestanding facility really? that's actually attached to a theater um, division, University of Tennessee, and several others, University of Maryland, um, have freestanding Did you get a chance facilities. to visit those? Mm. Yes, I have. And yeah. then you can come back and say, see, ours is you know, <laughs> the top of the line, right? There you go. <laughs> oh, you think of any, any closing comments or anything you'd like to share with the researchers, anything special that uh, you'd like to share with us? I just want to thank you for this opportunity to, to share with you and, and the fact that you are, are providing this opportunity for multiple individuals to share their story, I think is a, a mm. tremendous asset to the Purdue community. So thank you for your work. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Renee. This ends it.